Hello everybody, I'm Rebecca McGee. I'm a plant breeder with the USDA ARS at uh, Washington State University in Pullman, Washington. And this is Steve Van Vliet. And I'm the Regional Extension Specialist um, based out of Whitman County, Washington in Colfax. And we're here at Lind, Washington in the middle of the Advanced Winter Pea uh, uh, Yield Trial. And we're gonna talk about uh, how, we, how we made these peas uh, what their potential uses are, and how to grow them. Okay. Rebecca will go first. So, um, Austrian winter peas have been around for decades. Um, <clears throat> they were grown in World War II, uh, primarily because they were a source of nitrogen for the subsequent crops. Uh, they didn't have any nitrogen fertilizer then because it all went to munitions. But <clears throat> until about 2009, uh, Winter peas could not be sold as food quality peas. They could only be sold in the feed market. And feed peas only make about um, half to two thirds the amount of money to the farmer as a food quality pea would. So in 2009, marketing regulations were changed and it didn't matter then what season the peas were planted. If the seeds made food quality characteristics at harvest, they could be sold in the food quality channels and not feed. So 2009 was actually also when I started uh, working in this position. And I spent a couple of months when I first started talking to growers and processors and producers and saying, what, what do you need? What can I do that would make a difference for you guys? And time and time again, I heard food quality winter peas would be really nice. And so I thought that could be a good project. So I decided to take it on and looked at the Austrian winter peas and realized that there had to be quite a few changes that needed to be made to change an Austrian winter feed pea into an autumn sown food quality pea. Austrian winter peas are typically very tall. They have pink flowers and very small seeds. So for a food quality pea, I needed to have a pea that had large seed size and a clear seed coat. Didn't matter if it was yellow or green. And then for a farmer to want to grow them, they needed to, needed to be semi-dwarf, uh, semi-leafless, and have resistance to a lot of the abiotic, antibiotic stresses that an autumn sown pea was going to encounter. So that's why I did it. So how we did it was we started by making a tremendous number of crosses, thousands of crosses between winter and spring peas. We took the winter cold tolerance um, attributes from the winter peas and combined it with the quality attributes and a lot of the uh, disease resistance attributes from the spring peas. So we made the cross, we put the F2s out in the field in the autumn and let nature make the first round of selections for us. If a plant survived the first winter, it passed the first test. And so then that growing season at harvest, I made final selections and selected single plants that had uh, the semi-leafless characteristics, that were semi-dwarf, and that had white flowers and clear seed coats. We took those single plant selections, replanted them that autumn, and went through another round of selections. We did the same thing the next year, and the next year, and the next year. And finally, we had uh, pretty, pretty homozygous, homogeneous families that were um, then harvested or selected and then harvested in bulk and put into the trialing system. When they went into trialing, they first went in as single unreplicated plots. Uh, I only had a very small seeds, this much seeds, and that's all I had, had for enough to plant. So single plots, became replicated plots at one location the next year and the years after that the number of locations increased until finally after three or four years I had enough seeds and enough data to warrant sending um, advanced breeding lines to statewide trials like Steve Van Vliet runs in Washington, that Kurt Schroeder runs in Idaho and that their counterparts run in uh, some of the other uh, eastern states. After they had started into the trialing system, they also got sent to disease nurseries to screen for resistance to Fusarium wilt race 1, 
for resistance to aphanomyces root rot, and to Oregon for resistance to powdery mildew, as well as peonation mosaic virus, bean leaf roll virus, and uh, pea seed borne mosaic virus. So <clears throat> here we are in one of the advanced yield trials at Lind. This trial has 17 advanced breeding lines in it, and there are two checks. It was planted on September 11th, uh, 2019. Uh, there, in a randomized complete block design, uh, three reps, um, the plots are about 100 square feet. Um, <clears throat> I anticipate that this trial will be harvested around early mid-July, around the 10th of July is when we usually harvest out here at Lind. Uh, there are two lines out here that are very interesting to me. Uh, the first one is, they're just numbered lines, they don't have names yet. The first one is PS1430003W, and the other one is PS1430010W, so 3 and 10. Uh, the two checks out here are Spectre and Wyndham. And when I compare the performance of 3 and 10 with Wyndham, which is what they're most similar to, uh, they, they perform quite favorably. Wyndham was released from this breeding program um, in the 1990s, and it has small yellow seeds with ghost modeling on it. The seeds are about 16.1 grams per 100 seeds, and that knocks it out of food quality right there. The seeds are too small, and they have modeling on the seed coat. Uh, Wyndham at harvest maturity is about 38 centimeters tall and over three years the average yield has been about 4,460 4, kilograms per hectare. It's resistant to Fusarium wilt race 1, susceptible to everything else. Three on the other hand has green cotyledons, it has a clear seed coat and the 100 seed weight is about 16.9 grams. Um, its yield over three years has been approximately 4,600 uh, kilograms per acre, per hectare, and it's resistant to Fusarium wilt race one also. It's uh, much taller than Wyndham is. Uh, Wyndham, like I said, was 38 centimeters. Uh, three is 48 centimeters tall. Uh, Ten is the largest seed size of all three. It has a seed size of about 23.1 grams per 100 seeds, and it has yellow cotyledons. It's intermediate in height between Wyndham and three. It's uh, 44 centimeters tall at maturity, and it has the highest yield at uh, 4,700 kilograms per hectare. It's resistant to Fusarium wilt race one, as well as powdery mildew. All three of them have um, protein concentrations of 19 to 20 percent protein depending on the year they were grown and where they were grown but they're they're very very similar and they're also a little less than the typical spring pea but that seems to be um, par for the course for winter versus spring uh, seed protein concentrations so we have made breeder seed of both three and ten um, the breeder seed was made was spring sown um, in the northern hemisphere, taken to the southern hemisphere to our New Zealand nurseries where it was spring sown again, and then spring sown in, that was in the 2018-2019 cycle. In the 2019-2020 cycle, it was sent to New Zealand for spring sowing again, um, and we're in the process now of transferring these two lines to Washington State Crop Improvement Association. I'll apply for formal final release of these two lines as varieties uh, this coming autumn. So that's how I made this, why I made it, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Steve who's gonna talk about how to grow it. So again, I'm Steve Van Bleed. I'm the Regional Extension Specialist. And one thing I wanted to say first off is to do these trials, to be able to do winter pea production would not be possible without the collaboration and cooperation uh, partnerships such as I have with USDA ARS, Rebecca McGee, and with some of the other companies that we work with to be able to do these trials and bring this information to you. 
I'll talk a little bit about the agronomics, pretty much from seed to harvest, and just go through that real quickly. Um, when I finally was able to receive these lines, it's only been within the last five years probably that there, there's been extensive work on some of these winter variety testing trials. And I have locations now in five different counties. And so if a grower is interested in these, they really need to pursue where these varieties are grown into close to their location and close to their farm to know exactly which ones fit their production area. Here in Lind, as we know, it's very, very low rainfall. And that's why winter peas fit so well. We're in an area that you're not gonna be able to grow such things as a spring pea crop, but with winter peas, we can grow that. The first thing to consider though, whenever we grow a winter pea crop is the soil. What's the soil? Choose that site carefully, but what's the soil like? Over 90% of our soils here in the Pacific Northwest are acidic, and we have to be very, very careful. Peas are sensitive to pH, and so we can have that be detrimental it's detrimental to wheat, like you probably heard a lot about, you know, if you're producing wheat, but it's very detrimental to peas and anything below 5.4 is going to be very, very hard. Also, what are the nutrients? Do a soil test before you ever plant these and know what the soil is like. How much boron do you have in that soil? How much do you, we're very, very low in specific nutrients here in the Pacific Northwest, especially boron, chloride, molybdenum, um, sometimes sulfur, copper. So, and a lot of times, like I say, our pHs are very, very low. They might be a little bit higher here at Lind, but if you're anywhere in the Palouse or going down south and going into the, the Columbia County, Walla Walla County, they're, they're um, low pHs also in the acidic range. So address that, know that we need to do and get your nutrients up to snuff when you plant these peas. So that's kind of the first thing to do. Always, my recommendation, if you're we're gonna to go towards planting a winter pea crop, is apply a good seed treatment and also have an application of rhizobium. So you need an inoculant on these. Even in some of these areas that peas have been grown prior, it's really, really important to get that inoculum on there for the best production, the highest amount of yield that you're going to get in, the, in your pea producing fields. So as you do that, um, another thing to make note of that you could have a serious problem with, you're going into a different crop in a lot of these areas. A lot of times we're going into some summer fallow areas or if it's in a Palouse, it's different. But out here, it's going into summer fallow. So what has been previously applied? You've gone from a winter wheat, summer fallow system into now incorporating winter peas. So what's the herbicide carryover? If you have different types of sulfonylurea herbicides or different herbicides, those can cause major problems with the establishment of your winter pea crop. So really pay attention to the label, what's been applied. Really, you wanna know what's been applied two years prior so what kind of cropping systems, what the applications have been two years prior, and how is that going to influence your cropping production systems in the next two years? So um, choose that, the best variety that's going to fit your production zone, like we talked about. Several different companies know where your markets are. You know, you're going to want to know where your markets are, so you're going to want to check into companies such as PNW Cooperative, um, Spokane Seed does a lot with winter peas, um, Columbia Grain does work with winter peas, and some of these other companies work with them also. So um, Blue Mountain Seed down in the, in, in the Walla Walla area. So check on that. Um, we talked about seed treatment. Have the, the maximum rates, go by the label, but have the maximum rates to give you protection. The wonderful thing about peas, winter peas, is they're very competitive. You get them in, but what you have to be sure, you get them into the soil and get them into soil moisture. Also, you don't want to seed them at a very shallow depth. You want it to be seeded really at three inches, 
I like a three inch. Anything above two and a half inches, not necessarily do we want to go five inches deep, but get it into the moisture. We want to have at least below a half inch of moisture for that seed, for it to germinate, for it to get going, get out of the ground, and become very competitive. Now when it comes to seeding date, that can vary. It can vary in here. Like I said, you have to have moisture, but you're coming in after summer fallow. So you can seed that potentially from the end of September, such as you do a lot of times with, with the small grains crop, or you can go clear into November. What that would do is that's called more or less a dormant seeding and that crop would not emerge until early spring, but far earlier than such as a spring pea and the yield would still be very significant when it comes. Winter peas will yield approximately 100% to 300% of that of a spring pea crop. So a lot of times we see it um, at least twice the yield, maybe two and a half times that yield of spring peas. So having that nutrient balance, having the things that you're going to be applying and doing are going to be very well worth it when you're coming to that crop that has a very, very high yield. Um, seeding rate, your seeding rate is typically around uh, eight seeds per square foot, comes out to around 350,000 seeds per acre. So, so that's, um, that's probably the seeding rate you're gonna go with that's been the most opportune on that. You can go with a little bit higher and the yields won't, that won't drop that much. Um, winter peas will usually start to tiller after about the third node. And you won't see that, of course, until the spring. They, they're very, very winter hardy now. I've been doing, as I've been looking at these over the last couple of years, three years, that winter peas, we have very, very little loss, even in the tillers, but we have very, very little loss of these peas if we're seeding at the correct depth, correct rate, and um, into moisture. It come, becomes a problem if you're not seeding the moisture. What kind of diseases and pests? What the ni another nice thing, we're dealing with winter peas, and that's why we're talking about it, because they're very competitive. They get going early, they outcompete most of your broadleaf weeds. Um, sometimes the only problem you'll have are grasses. In some of these areas, the only thing I've had to spray is for some grassy weed control. So some of the herbicides you'll be using in your winter pea production is going to be such things as Bazagran, um, Select Plus, uh, clethodum, I should say. So Bazagran, clethodum, um, you're gonna use, uh, so your grassy herbicides and some broadleaf herbicides that are registered for that. And just go by the label and, and look at those application times. But like I say, very, very competitive, can outcompete a lot of our weed problems we're dealing with. Another advantage is it actually changes the disease cycles. You avoid specific diseases that you may have see that you may see within your spring peas. One thing that can influence yield in spring peas more than winter peas and is powdery mildew. Powdery mildew, which we have some lines that are actually resistant to powdery mildew now in the winter pea. But the interesting thing about it is these lines may develop powdery mildew in some of these areas that have wet because they'll keep the moisture underneath that canopy. But that powdery mildew will not influence negatively the yield as it will sometimes with, uh, with our spring peat crop depending on when that's coming on. Another thing is insect pests. Insect pests might not be as great because with this flowers at least three weeks prior to when our spring pea crop is going to be flowering. And that you can avoid the high temperatures which can cause abortion of those, those plants and seed set of the peas. And so you're getting higher yield, you're avoiding a lot of the problems, you're actually avoiding certain pests that are gonna come out at the hot time of the year and cause problems. What other pests are we gonna have problems with? Typically, we have problems with, with pea leaf weevil and we'll have problems with what we call pea weevil. And a pod, it's a pod weevil. It's actually a different insect, but it causes holes in the pods, in the seeds. 
And so those you typically will get problems with, especially the pod weevil, and you may have to do applications on that. But it's not any different than you have to do on spring peas. Same type of thing to keep up the quality of those peas when you market it. Um, pea aphids can also be a problem at certain times, but really you avoid a lot of the aphid problems and a lot of these other insect and disease problems by growing winter peas in production. Weed control. Weed control, we mentioned just a couple things for weed control, mainly about herbicide rotation. Pay attention to that. But when it comes to the weed control, we're going to use things such as Bazagran that we talked about, um, Clethodum, uh, uh, I can't, can't think of all the other different chemicals, but a lot of the grassy herbicides and broadleaf herbicides to get control of some of those different weeds. And see how those chemicals interact with others and when it comes to carryover and problems the, the following season. In harvest, um, we talked about the yield of winter pea production and the yields are going to be much higher. And we're going to get um, a, a better quality type product that we can get out to the, to the industry. And now through the development and being able to collaborate with these and get looking at different yellow, pea, yellow peas and green peas, we can have this increased quality and the markets filled with a product that I think is going to be a major crop. This used to be only a rotational crop. And I think this will be a major crop, not only within the Pacific Northwest, but spreading across the country and go into many, many markets across the world. What we wanted to show you in this demonstration is what we started with and where we've ended up and compare it with the uh, spring green and spring yellow peas that are commonly grown uh, in the northwest. The um, seed sample that's on the top left uh, where the stick is pointing is of old uh, Austrian winter pea variety named Melrose. Uh, that was the starting point. You can see how dark the seeds are and how small they are. Uh, the one right next to it is Wyndham. Uh, that was the first winter pea that was, uh, had less pigmentation on it than um, the Austrian winters, but you can still see that the seed quality is pretty poor. It's green, it's yellow, um, <clears throat> the seed coat is actually kind of green, and you can't see the ghost modeling on, in this picture uh, simply because it's so faint. But ghost modeling are small, faint, brownish lines on the seed coat um, that just have a, a really fine uh, faint cast to it. The pea on the bottom left is the variety named Hampton that was released from my program three or four years ago. Um, it's a green pea that um, is, has got a lot of uh, good disease resistance and uh, seed quality attributes going for it. And right next to it is uh, number three. Now compare the, the color, the shape, and the seed size of those two varieties. Uh, continuing on to the right is the winter pea number 10, and next to it is the spring pea universal. And again, compare the color, the size of the seeds, the size, and the shape of those two. Our objective in, in the breeding of these food quality winter peas has truly been to develop pea varieties that if you held a spring pea and a winter pea side by side in your hands, you would not be able to tell the difference. And certainly you can see when you compare 3 and 10 with Melrose and 3 and 10 with Hampton and Universal respectively, that we've really come a long ways.